Welcome to the Stoa. The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. All right, uh, check-ins. I'm feeling uh, uh, kind of like aggressively playful. <laughs> um, and I feel a little bit of a joy saying that. So welcome to the Stoa. I am the steward of the Stoa, Peter Lindbergh, also known as DJ Delicious sometimes. Um, and we're here at the Knife's Edge um, to discuss collective presencing uh, and uh, Rhea uh, Bach, um, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, is uh, here today and she's going to share her thoughts on her practice that she's developed. And I was a little bit of a naughty boy um, because last minute I pegged in Richard uh, to see if he wanted to host the thing uh, because he's more familiar with Rhea's work than I am. Uh, so Richard will be hosting, kind of facilitating the question period and um, after Rhea's talk. So how will, or, or for sharing, after she shares her thoughts. So I will look, Rhea will share her thoughts, then we'll open up for Q&A. If you have a question, just write in the chat box, and then Richard will call on you to mute it and, and facilitate that discussion, um, unless he wants to take me back in. <laughs> All right, so that being said, I'll hand it over to Rhea. Just this, to say, my name is Ria, means Maria, but you skip M and A, yeah? So that's, uh, that's my first name officially Maria on my passport but it's probably one of the reasons why I wanted Richard to host it as well <laughs> um, I can probably ask more interesting questions even than what is your name and how do we pronounce it um, the, the first one that comes to mind having some familiarity with your work um, but I, st I still feel like I'm a novice mm -hmm. is you've written this book called collective presencing and maybe it would be useful to talk before we get to the collective part about what, what is presence? What is it for? How do we get there? Why do you like it? <laughs> what do you know about presence? Can we visit there? Well, what is presence? For me, presence has to do a lot with being embodied, being in your body, aware of your body um, and being feeling grounded and centered and open and it's the whole thing about collective presencing is like can we use the stance of that you cultivate let's say in meditation or in any practice basically um, can we, we cultivate that stance while being in a conversation with each other and that that was the driving question I think which maybe not articulate at the beginning of the process but that's what made us move into this whole project let's say that brought eventually brought this whole model and practice out. So there's, yeah, I think there's, the practice is, do you, okay, yeah, do you realize, do I realize when I'm more or less in presence or am I taken up in ideas or am I more in emotions or and if I notice I'm not really present, do I know what, how I can come, come back? That's how I say, how I can come back to presence and openness and being in this engagement with the world. Also so short, but. If, if you say that you, um, you know, you've, you've kind of stumbled into this research question of how do we, cultivate a stance of meditation while we're in relationship and conversation. If that question wasn't clear when you started, what was guiding you? How did you know what to do? That was very interesting, yes. Um, at that point in time, which is like, I don't know, 10 years ago, um, in some 
what we call circle practice in in the conversation in the dialogue at some in some co conversations you feel like something's happening you feel like there's a certain quality in the conversation that's let's say beyond a normal conversation and at that point we were so intrigued we called it the magic in the middle because there was something about when you just attend to the middle and not really speak to each other or not really like yeah i agree with you but kind of being aware of what was going on through the conversation, through the dialogue, there was some, something that happened that we were fascinated by, or at least some of us, and we call it the magic in the middle. And so we were kind of hoping that it would happen, yeah? And not knowing what it actually was or, um, or how to get there, or the first ever, gathering we did we had a i think a three-day gathering where finally as facilitation team we said like we don't have any program we don't have any proposals we just drop it all and then in that afternoon and some people went walking and some people did whatever and somehow magically almost everybody converged into a circle at some point and we had like a two hour dialogue which was like with that quality and that yeah that sets me off on finding more about, finding out mm. more about it mm. so if if you um found a way to this magic by giving up on your role as host um so there could be a way of experiencing that as a disappointment like um it's, it could be an impossible riddle how do we get back there and um <laughs> so i'm curious what you've learned in the in the subsequent years of like how to what's the what's the pathway back to the magic like if 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 what you were doing didn't work and it was only your surrender and release that got you there is there something more active and intentional that you know how to do now as a host of this process, it's still, you have not much control or influence, but it's how you are present in the group itself and what are the questions you're bringing, what, how is your presence in the group. Um, can you invite people to maybe a deeper sense of presence? Um, but you really need to let go of any attachment because what I noticed, because we use a practice not to meditate or to have a nice dialogue. We use a practice to actually get to some new insights around a question that really matters so it's not just for the sake of doing it we actually want some real insights and if the question matters to us then you get a whole bunch of attachments let's say on all kinds of things so you first need to work that true like things need to be spoken needs to be checked out with each other dropped um maybe there's some tension and can we still again and again go back to presence and it's not easy especially when you have a stake in the in in in, in the question in the topic um, well, that's another puzzle. I, I wonder if you're going to keep throwing paradoxes at us. So you've got a question that really matters, but then you're not attached to the outcome. Um, how, do you, how do you discover a question that matters? Where do they come from? And that's indeed a whole art in itself. And um, I come from, from, let's say, a lineage that's called art of hosting, hosting conversations that matter. 
and there it is one of the real crucial capacities you need to train yourself in or as a team you train yourself in like if people want to have a conversation that matters many times when you ask them like what is the question they state a question but many times the question is kind of on a deeper level so you need to have a conversation about but what is it actually and my I'm trained and worked as a psychotherapist and a coach for long. So I know what people bring on a level, like this is the problem. Mm -hmm. Many times, what is the problem is something that's on a lower level. So I'm kind of used to look for that level. Mm -hmm. And when we organize a, a retreat or a workshop or with collective presencing, we do that work let's say up front with with the team that is hosting the event like what is the question that we really care for and yeah but that word is not right and we really take time to to craft mm. that question really well until we are all saying like yeah that's the question yeah. do you um in your everyday life like today right now do you have a stable of questions and development like do you do you wake up in the morning and you've got this sense of this you're kind of farming these these big questions that are been hovering around in your sleep and you're you're ready to pick one up like do you have one that you're that you're present to now that's um taking your attention um it's not that i wake up with them but um yeah um I'm sitting with this question these days. Um, so I'm very at ease with all these circles and dialogues and conversations. And, but what I don't know is how to build a business. That's mm -hmm. like really foreign to me. It's mm -hmm. like, I, I really feel like I'm four year old and I don't know anything about it. And I have a huge intuition, but on that, in that topic, it feels like ah, my intuition is not working. Please guide me. Take me by the hand. And so we were talking about with my partner, with other people in the collective presencing world, let's say. And we came to this question recently, like, could we find a collective practice where we actually build that entrepreneurial spirit together. Hmm. Like we know we have built consent and generative decision-making processes that we can describe and that we can uh, disseminate and everybody can learn it. But can we do so? Can we develop? Can we find a collective practice where this entrepreneurial spirit is actually helped supported by in all of us by all of us uh and doesn't mean we need to be in the same company at all um because many of us have like very have their own company or with two or three or i mean i think lots of people here just have their own private business i guess um so that's something that's on my mind and that I can feel that it's like, and that works in me. Like, yeah. mm. <laughs> <laughs> so assuming, take, you know, taking your own advice that there's, you arrive with a question and there's a question underneath that. Um, Could be. Um, mm. What, like, I mean, what I know of your work, you're an author and a teacher and a facilitator and a therapist, and you've got tons of different competencies and skills. And then there's, for some reason, even though there's some billions of businesses out there, you're finding an obstacle to you making your own business. Um, that's kind of puzzling to me when you've got such other, you know, plenty of other competencies. Is there, yeah, is there some obstacle that sits between you and that entrepreneurial spirit? That could well be. And it's pretty unknown territory for me. I mean, mm -hmm. I've, I'm self-employed, as they call it, since 
the 90s has always gone well. I have never done marketing or PR or anything. Um, and a couple of years ago, we started with, I started with three others to found a, a cooperative because how can I be real and uh, have integrity to advise others on collective presence, on collective practices, on decision making or conversations that matter if I'm not in the business myself. Yeah. So we have this company, we try lots of things out, but this doesn't mean that my income goes up or at, at all. And especially not now because people cancel all kinds of events. Um, so there's something and I can see some people have eat something that I don't have. And I wonder, can we spread it? Because there's, I see so many people who want to build a better world, don't want to go to business as usual, and are in this spread. But like, yeah, but I need to feed my kids and I need to pay my rent. And there's not enough income coming in. And we're like in between two worlds. Like, what is the collective practice that mm. we could help each other with? But I, I don't know. <laughs> I can only hold the question mm. or help hold the question. Mm. I, can feel, I can feel how that question matters, right? Like, it's got some... Yeah. Um, it, it, it's, it's mattering to me as well. Um, so with that question, that's the starting point. Then if you were applying your own methodology to yourself, you know, dare, dare I say it, what would be the next step once you've got this question? How do you... How do you do collective presencing about it? We actually started with our little, let's say, core team of, of collective presencing and a few friends. Um, and I can say we didn't come out with, with clarity yet. It's an ongoing process. Um, and that makes me wonder, like, what are assumptions that we may be holding that we haven't uncovered? Because for me, a dialogue and collective presencing is a generative dialogue in, in let's say the words of Otto Sharma. It's like many times as in therapy, many times it's like when you can uncover an assumption suddenly like aha the world of positive of solutions and of insights it's way bigger than i thought about around my question yeah. so it's it feels as if we haven't we haven't uncovered some of these assumptions that are actually holding us back from new insights that's what i think so I'm going <clears> to <throat> jump in. Um, so Rich was warming up uh, the room right now with some, because he has really tight question game at the knife's edge, uh, which I appreciate. And uh, so if you have any questions, just write in the chat box. Um, and then I'll unmute you and you can read it. Uh, or I will um, read it on your behalf. And we just got one from Tyson. So Tyson, if you'd like to read your question. Yeah, thank you, Rich and Ria. I'm enjoying this dialogue. And I'm very interested in the magic in the middle. And I, I really enjoy <laughs> being in that space. I'm curious um, what you do to create a container or a shared uh, intention or context or dialogue, um, like language to invite people into engaging that unknown in the middle, rather than maybe speaking from like, what they already know, maybe the temptation, like if a question comes up, the temptation to give advice and to solve it rather than like really be immersed in the question. So I'm just curious if you have like agreements or what type of things you do to create that space. Yeah. I mean, you can offer some guidelines or some principles, but it's really hard for people, uh, especially when the conversation or the topic, the question matters to them. Um, first of all, we, we work with a talking piece. 
like whenever somebody holds the piece even if that's a pen or whatever it is um that means this person speaks and the other ones listen and you can move the piece from one to one but to slow the conversation even more down you can put the talking piece in the middle in the middle of the circle and then say you can sense whenever you need to speak and i always explain it doesn't we try to speak from a place where that you haven't been thinking about beforehand so it's not um an idea i already had before i entered the room that's where we want to go can I speak something I haven't spoken anywhere yet? And that's pretty, pretty hard. Um, it doesn't mean you cannot tell a story or something that comes up because sometimes a story comes up that you might not even understand why it comes up. Yeah. And sometimes you have to check yourself like, I don't know why, but this seems like I need to tell this right now here. And then you will notice that somebody else picks up a meaning from that story and suddenly it reveals why it was meaningful in that, in that guiding question. And so it's, it's really important that you inhabit that space yourself or the ones who are holding the space that you can convey that with how you speak. If you say we do it like this and this and this and this, uh, yeah, it's, can you speak yourself? And have you worked with your team, the one or the two or the three others that hold it with you to, to be in that space together? Have you trained yourself actually? Have you practiced? enough um yeah that's the short short version i would say yeah okay. so if you <clears throat> have any questions and maybe you can practice it too I'm just gonna you know like lean into what questions emerge and just write it down and when i was leaning yeah. into that uh this question emerged right away um can can you measure wisdom um can you measure wisdom and uh, why I think I asked that is uh, a lot of people are giving me advice these days. Like I should get more sleep, do this, do that. And then the question that keeps coming up, can you measure wisdom? Um, and I don't think you can. And if a question or the question is the foundation of wisdom, then you can't really measure the accuracy uh, of what question to pick. So you have to rely on a different um, source. So I'm curious yeah. what, what comes alive. So... I think measurement comes from an ordered system, if I can use that model, where you can measure more or less wisdom, I don't think belongs in that. But um, we, we do seem to have a capacity in ourselves, in, in I call it subtle sensing that we have where we can sometimes feel like this is relevant not this this is it or this is my question or this is what i really need to do we do have an inner and and Jenpin calls that a felt sense and he writes with capitals um and i always give this or he gives this uh like when you're a somebody writes poetry and you write your poem and you know like there is a word but it's not this word i know it needs to be another word for the poem to be good so we do have a sense and it's a very precise sense like it's not this word it's close but it's not this one and until you have 
found it, then you say like, yeah, that was the word. So that kind of sensing capacity that we have, where it sits, I don't know, somewhere in us, and it's not, not at all rational, it's not even emotional, there's something energetic about it, although I don't want to be new agey about it, but that kind of sense is what you need to, to start to recognize in yourself and start to um, practice and check things out. Like I, I used like to, to train myself, like being in a big workshop or a conference. And then I would check like, okay, we go to eat and there's a big dining room. And I was like, I go with my sense where I need to sit. Like that table, that chair, that's mine for this noon or this dinner. And then see whoever shows up. And mm. sometimes that was amazing. And sometimes it was like, I don't know why I was sitting here, but you can, you can have these little tiny exercises for yourself to kind of train yourself in that way. Mm. So um, I have another question that is burning up. It's just like wrestling out of me, but I'm going to please it because Rich said Abby had a question. Um, so I might say that for the end. We'll, we'll see the, how the suspense goes. But Abby, if you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Thanks. Hi, Ria. Um, I've been reading your work, Collective Presence, in the book. And oh, wow. <laughs> it's been great. It's really resonating, especially coming from a focusing background. Um, I, okay. You mentioned a lot uh, about, um, you know, inner process and doing the deep work. And so I guess my question is, I'm wondering the modularity of the circle format in various different organizations. And mm -hmm. if this is only, um, if you've taken it to various different locations and maybe expanded to organizations. Um, because it seems like, I don't know if it's a prerequisite to have done that personal work and be willing to look deep in in order to participate or, um, or maybe not. Yeah. Um, we do have, um, broad, let's say what I called art of hosting, which is a community and a practice and a whole, uh, field of practice. It's about conversations that matter and it goes always with it starts always with the three day training and we it has been brought in like into the european commission although it's called participatory leadership they didn't like art of hosting it was a bit too fluffy uh, or whatever so it's practices about conversations and about dialogues and and in all kinds of ways with big groups, small groups, um, conferences, stakeholder gatherings. But what I want to point to is that if you have like, let's say the biggest thing we ever did was probably a two day conference with 800 people. You do have a team then of six, seven, eight, ten 10 people. And what we try in these teams is to come to that level of co-creation. Like, what are we sensing? What is the client saying? What are the people, what is the actual question? Like, and from that sensing capacity in this core team, that's from where we do the work, yeah? And now, uh, after 10 years, you can see how this practice is spreading because some DGs, how we would just, like ministries within the European Commission have adapted this approach in, in, as their way of working. Um, so I'm not saying that collective presencing itself is like known anywhere, mm -hmm. but like the leading up to it, like can we actually start to listen in meetings instead of wanting to fight or wanting to win? That's getting some ground, even in the European Commission. So, yeah. So it sounds like the participants don't actually have to have the sensing capability 
to begin with? Actually, everybody has it, but we just not used to use it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if you are at ease with inviting people into that space and in naming it in whatever words you can give it that you think they can kind of relate to, if you feel comfortable to invite them into that space, most of the times people come with you and are actually happy that they can finally talk. Like not, not debate, but have a conversation. Many, sometimes you need to, like in the commission, you need to say like, hey people, you're not representing your company or you're not representing your country. You're here as a person with your expertise, of course, but you're here as a person. And can we speak from that level? Mm. It's, of course, it's different paradigm. But. Yeah, um, I have another follow-up question, if that's okay. Um, in the book, you talk a lot about following aliveness and follow what's alive. And it could be something that if I just don't feel alive to do it now, I'm just not gonna do it. Um, I kind of wonder how that plays out because uh, something else that's in my mind is like focus and discipline. And that, I, I don't know how the two can really blend together um, because it seems like I'm just following my feelings if I'm just following what's alive. Or maybe it's kind of the felt sense, like the somatic piece. So maybe you could dive into that a little bit. Yeah. What is, I would say, healthy discipline and what is beating yourself up, yeah? Um, what is doing even stuff like, for me, it's like doing my accounts. It needs to happen now and then. I really don't like it, although I, I can do it well, but I don't like doing it. Um, from, from psychology, is if you put yourself under stress, like I need to do this now. And when the discipline is that kind of stuff, that kind of energy, it will always trigger the opposite. That will say, fuck it, I don't do it. You know? Because there is pressure, then something comes to balance it. But if the discipline is like a lost, Yesterday, I had a conversation with, with my partner that went not well. I had the discipline to go sit on my meditation cushion because I want to. I want to step out of the emotional charge and I want to come back to balance. That's also discipline. Not because I have to or I need to, but because I choose to do that, not easy. That's also discipline, but it's another, it comes from a different place. What if you're like a writer and you're like, I have a writer's block, but then like actually having the discipline to write out things, help me push to the next step. What about in yeah. that scenario? I think it's because you want to actually. And you know that it helps to start writing anyway. It's not because of, of an authority that says now you have to work. Even if it's an inner authority, it's more like I choose to do this because I know it helps. Even if it's not easy. Okay, thanks. And I'm always impressed to hear that people read my work because you never know you know <laughs> it's some good stuff um so uh zach can you put yourself uh, off mute and ask your question where is mr zach i'm gonna un I, don't know. Yeah. I don't see his face so okay he just jumped on oh there he is no yeah. he I've had some other questions come up in the midst as well. Um, but unless Peter says otherwise, I'm going to follow the directive and ask the question that I posted initially. 
Um, yeah, Rhea, when you were when you were speaking closer to the beginning, you were talking about like a workshop or like retreat context, I think, where on I think you said something to the effect of like on the front end of that, there's a lot of work to like refine the question uh -huh. that people want to circle around. And from what I'm remembering, like there was some suggestion that there to me that there is like a point at which there's like at least relative group consensus around like what the like what the question really is that people want to dig in on. Um, I'm wondering like in your experience, you know, is is reaching that consensus typical on these kinds of settings? How necessary is it? And you know, if you don't reach it, how does that change the experience? Like, can you speak to the relationship between like finding that group consensus and like the yeah. quality of the circle maybe? Okay. Um, I first want to speak about that word consensus because consensus many times mean like, oh, we need to talk and talk and talk until there, everybody can agree with it. And from what I'm talking about is not about agreement. In these teams, let's say, hosting teams, facilitation teams, when we try to come up with what is our guiding question for the next retreat, indeed, is more like, is our felt sense of everyone is it in alignment with each other? That's different than agreeing. It's more like it feels real, it feels right, it feels the right question. It's not like, oh yeah, I can agree, you know? Um, okay, let's go with that. It, it needs to be alive in each of us. And many times when people, groups use consensus, it's more like in, in, in the area of, uh, oh, we first had a conflict and now we need to come to consensus. Um, and there is, most of us who have been there have done that. We don't want to go to consensus, but then there is the consent decision-making, but I won't go into that. But for collective presencing and how we, in teams that host conversations for others, it's not that kind of consensus where we agree. It's more a, an alignment of sensing that this is the question that is at, that's most meaningful. I'm not sure if I can explain it very well. But it's, it's very, sometimes a very subtle, subtle nuance there. Do you have a follow-up question, Zach? Um, but to, because part of your question was to be these circles the most generative. The question, of course, you need to speak to people who are joining the conversation or the dialogue. Um, but to have a generative conversation or a generative dialogue. Um, in that regard, it's really um, informative to, to understand or learn about the four levels of listening and conversation that Otto Schammer uses um, and to really understand what generative means, what, how it is different than agreeing or being even understanding each other on an empathic way but it's more like indeed like what Abby named like brings does this bring more life into our organization or our circle or does it generate energy yeah for that so um, since there's no questions in the chat box, I think people have people have for some reason, uh, maybe me and Rich can start playing um, about sourcing the question that feels most alive. 
Can you hear me? I'm just changing my mic. Okay. So the question that's coming up is, how do you make love to the unknown? Say that again. How, how to make love? Maybe I'll re reword it. Like, how do we make love to the unknown? Yeah. In the beginning, when we were in this process of uncovering this all, um, we talked a lot about the future. Um, um, Otto Schammer also talks about the future is already here. Um, somehow, I myself and others like, yeah, we, we, we look at this, it's now and the future and it's like linear. And I wanted to get rid of that linear idea. And that's how I came up with like, a potential there is always potential in people in relationships in groups of people in organizations there's more potential than what is already present but then you actually need to yeah kind of love that that thing that is not there yet <laughs> yeah that unknown potential of yourself or from your organization or your group of friends. <laughs> um, and I, the best thing to, to, to relate with it is like when you have children, you, you don't know when they're eight, they want to be a footballer or a teacher or a pianist or, but you, you, you hold them and you you hold that potential that can go that way or that way or all kinds of ways and it's unknown you don't know where they end up 10 years later um and even 20 years later um, and still you you are in love with that what's in them even you haven't seen it <laughs> yeah and that's also for us, I think, especially in this time, like there's something unknown that's going on. There's some unknown potential that might come to manifestation. It might not, but it might. And can we just, yeah, be in love with that? Can we, instead of like, oh, I don't know what it is, or it's, it, or it's oh, it should be more of this or more of that, or less of that that we already know. What if it's something really different? Um, and that's what I got fr from through Bonita Roy, who mm -hmm. has read Gapster, if you can follow me, um, where he talks the, about the ever present origin. Like, it's not that we just evolve in a linear way, or maybe most of the time we we grow it like this, it goes up and up and up. Actually, every minute, everything that exists is there. And we drop into what he calls origin, and it's possible to come with something new, with all that was already before. So there is, there is a, a possibility every moment to change. And just not linear, it can be like a phase transition. Like some people of you might have the experience from like suddenly, yeah, I understood or suddenly I realized or, and you become a different person, at least in some ways. And so hmm. I think in, in our society, we don't have that. I can only name it love for for mm. for life actually. Yeah. You know, with the like oh suddenly. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I wanted to say we don't have that yet. Um and now uh, Rhea is going to bring her sunshine and ask a question. <laughs> yeah, I'm wondering if there is um a way to measure collective presence. 
And how do you know, like when a group has achieved it and if everyone in the group can sense it, like, is it just like a, a knowing? I wouldn't know how to measure it. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, but it, if I, one of the chapters in the book or pieces in the book is about the one next elegant minimal step. Like we are in such complex domain. We don't know where it leads us. So if we, through a conversation, through a dialogue, we come to an understanding of, ha, huh, that's indeed the next step we, we can take. Not something very difficult, but something we feel like that's the, that follows naturally from where we are, from what we have discovered or from what we have been talking about. And then you do that step, whatever that step is. And it might be like, oh, we need to talk some more <laughs> sometimes, but sometimes it's an action. And I hope we get better and better at sensing like this is a step we are going to take and that's an, an maybe a small action but that for me that's the ultimate purpose of this whole practice to actually come to actions in the world and not for the purpose of oh let's have another good conversation that actually doesn't bring us much <laughs> but, but you have to practice a lot of practice uh, conversations to become good at it. That's the other part. All right, so we have uh, one more question. Um, Tanya is feeling into something. Um, do you have a Go question ahead. that's uh, emerging, Tanya? Yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm connecting a lot with what you're saying. Um, it's making me look <laughs> twitchy. Um, I think, and I'm thinking of experience, experience that I've had recently with a housemate, and we're part of a learning community, a larger learning community, um, and we communicate through Slack, and, and she was encouraging me to just write into the Slack without knowing, like, what I'm going to say, and it's similar to what you were pointing at, and um, I feel like there's both that um, encouraging people to just, like what you just did, Peter, you just invited me to just, and I was like, I'm just gonna write, I have something I'm feeling into, I don't know what it is exactly. Uh, thanks, Tyson. Um, yeah, there's, there's a question too around how do we do this on Zoom, which is a whole other thing, <laughs> um, and feel each other. But I, I feel like there's something around the like holding each other in um, a creative tension of our learning process. Um, I really felt her doing that with me, and I, and I've been doing that with her, where like she's had patterns that come up that get in her way, um, and I know I do in groups too that where I like talk and I'm talking from what we might call ego or um old patterns and attachment i think you're using that um but if we have this a, sort of agreement that we're like she knows that i don't really want to do that and, and i know she doesn't she doesn't want to go into her old patterns um it's like we we're we're holding we're holding each other and, and it's we've made that vivid and clear mm -hmm. it changes the whole field um i don't know what the question is <laughs> i think uh there's just this sort of i was hearing you connect it to sort of the individual process and then i was feeling it in my experience of the collective that's happening um I don't yeah know. i think it's really helpful if you make that explicit amongst yourself this is mm. a learning or a way of learning or a way of getting other ways of learning and knowing into the space. Since we're Western mind trained, it's most of them very conceptual. 
Right. Mm -hmm. Mental. Maybe in groups and circles, it's emotional. But there's also that energetic knowing, that intuition, that other ways of inner knowing. Um, I think we desperately need to be in balance with all the rest. Mm. And if you say that's something I want to cultivate or something that I want to train or let's all train it or make it explicit between you and then you have the space to experiment and to learn from mm. it and come back to it like after three months or one month say like what happened or what did you learn or, yeah. Mm. So um, I'm going to end it here, uh, and I'm, I'm also going to uh, send an invitation uh, to you, Rhea. So how, how this emerged is that Richard put you on my radar multiple times, like, you got to check out Rhea, you got to check out Rhea. Um, and then somehow I got on your radar, you've been reading my journals, and then you reached out to me, um, and just saying how you liked the, the process of honesty of me putting myself out there, and I felt called to bring you on. And we're here and I have a very strong sense that your gift to the world is finding the right question. Um, and the STOA, we are, you, you're talking about the uh, uh, entrepreneurial spirit and that's sort of like a difficulty. Yeah. So we're operating on the gift economy here at the STOA. So we view uh, the STOA as a gift to the world and whoever's inspired to give a gift to the STOA can do so. And people have been inspired, giving me money, they've been giving me help, they've given me all kinds of things, which is uh, some very grateful for. And what's interesting is people who are regular facilitators are launching off with this model and doing their own thing. So Colin Morris from the Existential Dance Party, he, he opened up his own digital dance studio about embodiment, and it's based off the gift economy. And then he's, he's sort of the steward of that space. And, I'm, and Tyson, who's in the room right now, I imagine he's gonna open up a digital rap studio one day and then you know, have, have that. He's, a, he's, a current, he's been freestyling through a pandemic right now. Um, and so you're very welcome to have a regular session here if you like. Uh, and you can be a big, based off the gift economy, people can offer you gift. I have people's the regular facilitators. And if it works, you can open up your own uh, digital campfire. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we will have a session on Friday anyway. Yeah. So if there's, if there's interest, yeah, we can. Because to really uh, have a, a deep experience of collective presencing, one session of one hour or one and a half is maybe not enough, but yeah, we could, that's where we will start. So would you like to talk about the session we're having, uh, I think Thursday, uh, like what can people then expect? Was that to me? Yeah, Sorry. that was to you. We have a question. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, this Thursday we have um, an event with you, uh, actually practice session, uh, 90 minutes. Fra it's Friday. Huh? Was it Friday? It's April 24th. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, you're right. It's Friday. It's Friday. Um. Okay. Um, yeah. uh, it's Friday. Yeah, that's a, the sunshine just keeps shining. <laughs> yeah, we have to think about the question that's really speak to us that we still need to do. Um, that's a life in this space somehow. And we will just be in circle and have a talking piece mainly in the middle after mm. maybe a short check-in from everybody um and see what comes up i don't know what's going to happen mm -hmm. yeah um that's what we'll try to do and um, i would be yeah can we feel each other on zoom you're amazed what you can do on zoom um, I fell in love on Zoom. Amaze so. me. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, so yeah, RSVP to the website to that event. Uh, I'll make some closing announcements in a moment, but uh, thanks so much, Ria, for coming on. Uh, and I look forward to uh, seeing you again on Friday. Um, so tonight we have a couple of events that I'll mention. Uh, one that I'm uh, hosting called Emancipate the Daemon at uh, 6 uh, p.m. I have no idea what that's gonna be about. I'm, I'm waiting for the daemon to tell me. So uh, if you're interested to find out, uh, feel free to RSVP to that. Then right after that, which I think it may be the, the daemon events foreshadowing this, is building an aesthetic movement, which Rachel Haywire. Um, you know, I think if we're gonna steal the culture, I think it's gonna have to be fun and beautiful and artistic. 
Um, so that being said, you can go to uh, the gift economy uh, if your daemon inspires you to provide a gift to the stoa. And, uh, oh, Tyson would like to share something. Um, yes, because he has an event coming up on Saturday. So Tyson, feel free to go off mute. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, I want to, uh, to say to Tanya, I really like felt you and heard you while you were speaking. And one of the greatest gifts that I've been receiving lately is this invitation to presence something in me to explore a leading edge that maybe I never have before. And that has been so enriching. And some of my newest, like deepest connections have happened by someone allowing me that space. And freestyle or rap, rhythm and poetry has also been a tool for me to do that. Like I've got something and it's stirring inside of me, it's coming up. And so freestyling it out to music with a group of people being there and hyping me up has really been supportive to that as well. And so I wanted to tag in the freestyle and let y'all know that on um, Saturdays, we do, we have a freestyle session at the STOA and it's a really good opportunity to be invited into that space. Yes. And um, I really appreciate this experience and look forward to presencing next. Yeah, let me, let me hype that event up a little bit more. Uh, the first one was last week and it was fucking delicious. <laughs> it was, uh, um, yeah, I was so insecure, so nervous, but like uh, just the loving support and allowing what wants to come out, come out was, was quite good. And it was, it felt really spiritual. Um, so I do recommend that. And my nickname there, I think is going to be DJ delicious. So, uh, you know, if you want him, want to see him <laughs> and, uh, Rhea also, you have an event, uh, on Sunday. Do you want to uh, go off mute and talk about that? Yeah. So we did our first one last Sunday. Uh, it was called the oxytocin party and Essentially, it's just a way to deepen our connection, deepen our trust so that we can challenge each other more, um, to feel more connected, to really feel each other in a, like a fun way, uh, be a little vulnerable and playful with one another. So it can really open up these spaces to not play it safe and really feel safe with one another to express in ways that might feel a little bit charged. Um, yeah, and just have fun doing it. So mm -hmm. Sunday nights, eight o'clock. And, and that was the, like, the most fun I had in such a long time because I'm so serious while well, I was freaking gravitas and stoicism. And then I needed that. And we had this one exercise, I'll say briefly, like uh, it, was, it, was, it was really well designed. And then we had to write a poem to each other. Like we've gotten breakout rooms. So one person had to start with a line, like what love is. And the other person did it. The other person did it. And then we read it out loud afterwards. And I was with Key and I got the freaking giggles like no tomorrow. <laughs> it was just what was coming out was crazy. Um, so that is a really a treat. And I thank you both Tyson and Rhea for, for finding the stone and giving your gift. Um, that being said, everyone, um, be well. And thanks Rich for uh, getting tagged in last thank minute. Thank you all <laughs> and thank you Rich and thank you Peter.